Let me also extend greetings to you all in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. It is good to see you all and indeed uh, greet uh, visitors who are here for the first time. We have Tian's parents, Velma and Kobas. So welcome to the Feast Day Bible Church. Good to see you. And Amanda. Amanda was a, a member of our church, uh, left for Australia to join Horizon Church. And uh, she left while this was still called Hope Bible Church at the time. Uh, good to see you, Amanda. And also Godfrey, who left not so long ago, but he's back again for uh, reasons I will not share. But uh, good reasons, nonetheless. And a copy of God's Word, turn with me to First Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Our text will be from verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 5, but we will today only consider the first part of this three-part sermon, uh, which is verse 18 to 20, but we will read verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 5, to hear what the Lord has to say to us. So let us hear him speak to us then from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 Chapter 4, verse 5. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one must be trustworthy. But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, Do not go on passing judgment before time, but wait until the Lord who comes, wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of man's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. In this section, we find three cautions from the Lord, three cautions about God's ministry or or cautions against self-deception about God's ministry plan so that we may do ministry God's way. God is cautioning us not to deceive ourselves about how he does ministry or what his plan for ministry, for building the church as we saw last week is. He wants us to follow his ways and only his ways are wise. And if we follow our ways, it means then that we are deceiving ourselves. And so he cautions us then against self-deception so that we may do ministry his way. The first caution we see in verse 18 to verse 20, and that is, uh, do not deprive yourself of God's blessings. The second we find in verse 21 to verse 23, and that is, do not declare yourself as sectarian. And then in chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 5, do not disregard servants of God. God cautions you then not to deprive yourself of the blessings that you should get when you follow the way he does ministry. He cautions you not to declare yourself as someone who follows different sects that people create in the church 
Like we saw, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ, and I am of even myself. And then he cautions us, lastly in verse uh, 1 to 5 of chapter 4, to not disregard the servants that he uses to equip us or to equip you to do the work of ministry, to build his church. Let us pray then and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that, Lord, you speak clearly to us, and we thank you that we have this privilege this morning to hear how you work. And, Lord, we thank you for your spirit who is with us to help us understand how you do ministry. Lord, we pray that you may use us then by your spirit to hear the truth of your word, to understand them and to live by them. We pray, Lord, that we will see that this proceeds from the gospel and that, Lord, in everything that we do, Christ will be magnified and glorified and that we will be able to spread the gospel of truth, Lord, knowing how you do ministry. And we pray that, Lord, you will use us in serving you, to serve you the way you want us to serve you. In this church and in all the churches, Lord, where some people here may find themselves serving and we thank you, Lord, um, for this. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The prophet Jeremiah tells us that the unregenerate human heart, the unsaved person's heart, is desperately sick. And no one but the Lord alone can understand the heart of a, an unregenerate person or the sickness, the depravity of a person who is not saved. And he tells us it is because the Lord alone searches the heart and tests the mind in ways that we cannot because he is God. He knows what's in any, any, everyone's heart and mind. And similarly, we are told by the Lord that his word is able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and can discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Only God's word can do that and go that far in exposing who we really are in our hearts and in our minds. God can perform then a heart, mind, and soul surgery in ways that no one can including yourself. You cannot even examine yourself the way God can examine you. No one can fully understand and see internally and even predict what you or somebody is going to think or do in the future. Only the Lord can. And so when he examines someone, when he looks at what is in our hearts and minds and looking at our actions today, he doesn't just look at what's happening currently he can even see what's about to happen, and we cannot. When we hear that God is able to do this, perhaps you think that there are many ways. God must have many ways of doing this. If he's able to examine every one of us, then he must have many ways of doing this so that he may always get it right every time. However, what we have been seeing and what we're going to see in this passage is that God does the same thing every time. He does the same thing and says the same thing over and over to achieve the results that he wants to achieve. And his methods of doing things never become irrelevant. His methods of doing things never need improving, even if the times change. God is still the same. His word still says the same things that he has been saying for over 6,000 years. In theology, we refer this to God being simple. It's not difficult, it's not complex. We just have his word to understand him and to see what he does. But man, on the other hand, is complex. As we are sitting here hearing the word of God, we all can come to the understanding of what God says and who he is, even as we had when we were called to worship this God by Tebuchu, we can understand who he is. But I'm sure if we were to understand one another and attempt to understand one another, we will see how difficult that is because we are complex. 
There is one God. Even though we exist in three distinct persons in the one divine essence, He is simple. The Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, simple God. His ways, simple. He tells us in His Word. There are about 8 billion people in the world, 195 countries, and each person in those countries is different. But God understands each and every single person intricately, and he communicates to each and every single person in this world using one book, one message. The message of salvation is the most important message that God says to all humanity, and he communicates it to all who need to be saved. And that message never changes regardless of where this person lives. And then when he is going to continue talking to his people, he's going to use one book, and there will never be a different book that God will use to equip his people and to cause us to change. It doesn't change as people change all the time. So with God then, in order to get the results that honor him, as he wants us to honor him and to do things his way, we have to do the same things. We have to do what God wants us to do every time, and he will take care of the outcome. We should never try different methods. We should just be faithful to what God says we should do and say, as we find it in the Bible, and he will take care of the outcome. We preach the gospel. And there is nothing else that we preach. And there's only one gospel. And there's no other gospel that we preach. There's only one gospel that saves men from the wrath of God and from sin. And we will not preach another gospel. We teach the truth of how we ought to live as God's people. And that never changes. But as we preach the gospel, and as we teach the truth of the word of God, what God tells us in his word is that some people will be saved by this gospel and some people will not be saved by the gospel. When we teach the truth, some people will be changed by the truth and some people will not be changed by the truth. And this is what we see Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. And up to this point, he has been making the same, gospel, same, same argument that he is presenting only the gospel of Christ and him crucified, and this is how we ought to live our lives, based on what Christ has done for us. And that is what is pleasing in God's sight. He says that this is what will save sinners and change sinners to be people who are pleasing in God's sight. This is what will change the, the unbeliever's nature from being depraved to being somebody who is saved. There's nothing else and only the gospel uh, that we preach. Frank, I don't know if you want to have a word with uh, the people next door. Thank you, Frank. But sadly, what we have in this world is that some people think that they are wiser than God, and they want to employ different methods of doing the things of God. Some people look at the church and think that if things don't work in the church, we must be pragmatic. We must look at what works and then keep on doing different things depending on how people feel and where we are and then keep changing the methods and hope that we will find different or get different results. People think that if we want the church to grow, we must employ church growth methods that people sell in order for the church to grow. But we cannot do things God's way if we use ways that are not regulated by God. And if that is you, if you think that we must change the way church has been done over the past 2,000 years, then what Paul is saying here is that you are deceiving yourself if you think that you have better ways of doing church and of understanding God. But God does not want you to persist in that deception. That is why we are looking at this section. 
We're looking at this section together this morning because God does not want us to be self-deceived. But God is going to make the point and he's not going to try and prove it to those who believe that they are wise. He's simply going to say those who think that they are wise in their own ways should become foolish. He's simply going to say your ways are not honoring to him. Leave your ways, follow my ways. That is, become a fool so that you may become wise. And we may have these ways that people can visibly see. We may have these ways in our minds. And we may have ways that we think that we will employ in time to come. But God knows. God knows all of that. And he knows deeper than we can ever imagine or think. But then you as somebody who is listening to the word of God this morning are warned against self-deception. And self-deception and the reason why we have to be warned or cautioned by God against self-deception is because it is elusive. You may never know or understand or even see when you are deceiving yourself. It is elusive. But as I said, it is not to God. He does spiritual surgery. He sees what we cannot see with our eyes. He sees our hearts, our minds. And so deception cannot elude him. And that is why when he speaks, his word reaches everyone. But the holy frightening truth about this is that if you are self-deceived or if you are presently self-deceiving, you may not easily know it. And you have to think about whether this is true of you or not, whether you know it or not. This is a call then to pause and examine yourself. It is not to argue with God or try to say, I don't think I'm self-deceiving. I don't think that I have deceived myself in regard to things that God wants me to do. This is saying, you may not know. So take time to think. Don't be quick to defend yourself. If you think that you are wise, God says that you are not if he knows it. And we can never claim to be wise and think that God will not know whether we are wise in his ways, in his eyes or not. Because if we are going to think that way and argue that way, what Paul is going to do in this section, as I said, God is not going to argue with anybody. And Paul in this section, even though he's been talking to the Corinthians, going back and forth with them and arguing with them, here what he's doing now is he's taking the words of the Corinthians, their arguments, and he's zooming in on the Corinthians saying that they are wise. And then he's saying, I'm not going to argue with you whether you think that you are wise or not. What he's going to do is going to say, let me put you here and God here and then you will have that argument then. He says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and verse 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. Paul is saying, you cannot deceive God. God knows what you're truly sowing. He knows your motives. He knows your thoughts. He knows your ways. He knows your intentions. He can see fully who you are and what your plans are for today, tomorrow, and the future. But to be deceived, then, as elusive, is to hold to something that is erroneous about the building of the church. To be deceived is to be in error and not even know that you are in error or even see that you are in error. To be de uh, deceived, self-deceived, as we saw earlier in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, is to be divisive in the church and, and don't regard yourself as being divisive in the church. It is to be sectarian, as we saw I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and even myself. 
It is to be secular in your thinking, to think that the methods of this world must be imported into the church so that we may be effective. It is to attempt, as chapter 1 verse 17 says, to empty the cross of its power by holding to a different gospel. It is to hear the word of God and not apply it. And then there are many more ways that God does not approve of, that people do and approve of, and that is to deceive yourself. But we are cautioned not to be worldly, not to be shaped by the world in anything that we do in our lives, concerning the church most importantly, and in our private lives outside the church. And unfortunately, some Christians don't even know what is Christian and what is not. Some Christians don't even know what is of God and what is of the world. Some Christians don't even know what is biblical and what is cultural. And that is how deception works. And friends, it may even be as simple as having unbelievers as your closest friends closer to you than believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is plain and simple, and I know people will argue against that. That God says, your family are those who are redeemed, belong to the family of God, your closest people. And it is not easy to be close with people who you do not share blood and flesh with. But we are required to have intimate communion with one another, to be as close and as close and intimate as possible as Christians. It may even be as simple as drinking more of the unbelievers or from unbelieving advices than from believers, confiding in unbelievers than believers, enjoying unbelievers' company than enjoying your God-given family, the Christians. It may even be something like enjoying activities of this world and Christian fellowship. And then you will wonder why you can't get rid of ungodliness, fleshliness, temptation in your life. Who are you closest to? What are your ways? On what path do you walk on? Ask yourself. And so pray then that this passage will help you. Pray as we study this passage together that God will help you where you don't see or where or if you don't know of your self-deception. That God will help you because he knows. He will help you to be pleasing in his sight. Pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. He prayed and asked the Lord to search him. He said, search me, O God, and, and know my heart, because you do and can. Try me and know my ancient thoughts, anxious thoughts. And if there is any hateful or grievous way in me, please lead me to the way of everlasting life. He said, I may not know some of my ways if they are grievous in your sight or not. But please search my heart. Accept the caution then against self-deception and God will help you. And the first caution then to accept against self-deception about God's ministry plan in verse 18 to verse 20 is do not deprive yourself of God's blessings. Don't deceive yourself and end up depriving yourself of God's blessings. And we will see what those blessings are. But observe in verse 18, then, Paul, giving us that command, let no one deceive himself or herself. That's very straightforward. He says, you deceive yourself in this way. If any among you think that he or she is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. If you think that you are wise according to this world order, the way you're doing things in a secular way in society that do not refer to God at all or come from God, 
If you think that you are wise because you do things and things are working out in your life, even though the demands to do those things and the instructions and the regulations don't come from God, don't think that that is wise only because it's working. You may be called to let go of it. Such as the methods that people employ to have people come to church and for churches to be filled. Just because pragmatically as working, it doesn't mean it is pleasing in God's sight. Beware and be careful then of that. And this is not to say that there are no useful things in this world. And even as I mentioned earlier, this is not to say don't even have unbelieving friends. It doesn't mean that at all. Because there are many useful things in this world. I think we have many friends who are unbelieving and we should love everybody, even those who are unbelieving. But when it comes to conducting business in the church, when it comes to you living out the gospel, and as we saw some time ago, there is no part of your life and anything that you can do that does not relate to the gospel, emanate from the gospel, then you have to do it God's way. God has provided for you a plan to live your life. God has provided for this church a plan for how this church must, be, must conduct its business. He has given us the tools we need to build the church. We do not need to employ any other tools that are outside of the God-given tools that we find in the Bible. We should not import things into the church that we have even learned from the world, however useful they may be, to aid God. We cannot aid God. We have to let go of them and find God's things and God's ways. Learn from God's people and God's word. And I have seen extremes of uh, what I'm talking about and uh, the mild evidences of people doing ministry and conducting their lives this way over the years. And we saw this when we studied together the topic of skillfully combining God's word with music as, a, as an example. That I've seen many people who, before they became Christians, were very skilled and very talented in doing music. I know of people who are skilled and who were skilled and talented before they became Christians in writing, being able to write and compose things. And then as soon as they became Christians, all of a sudden they were Christian writers or Christian musicians. Baptizing the ways they have learned, sanitizing them in Christian language, and then making them Christian. That's so easy. It happens so many times. I have seen in many churches, people assigned roles in the church based on the roles that they play outside of the church and even given offices in the church based on their successes wherever they may be, not based on the qualities that Paul gives us in First Timothy chapter 3 to look at a man whether they are qualified to hold church office or not. But God says that that's not the way to do church. First he says become a fool, rather, let go of those things, and then if the world says you are a fool, yes, become a fool. Because you will see, then that means you are becoming wise by doing things God's way. If you are a professor in theology, before you became a Christian, for example, and then when you become a Christian, you have to be regarded as a new convert in the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn the ways of Christ. And then in due time, if you prove yourself qualified and you have the qualities of being a pastor or a leader in the church, then you will be recognized by the church that has authority to see and to search whether a man is called to ministry or not. It does not mean because you have this knowledge, all of a sudden you should be a pastor in the church, and it has happened in other churches. Rather become a fool and say, I will sit down and even learn from people who may not be as qualified and even as educated as I am. Recognize that the church is a very special institution. God uses people in the church, and we saw early on that God does not say who is wise intellectually, 
he looks at people who are spiritually mature to build his church and to contribute to ministry. God uses godliness and godly abilities to grow his church. But if your experiences and, and knowledge don't align with, align with how God does things, then become a fool. Let go of those ways and adopt God's ways. Adopt his ways of doing things, not your ways. And don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't deceive yourself. Don't insist on your ways in the church because church will be different. And in the church, you will have people who have differences and sometimes may have different preferences. And we are called not to insist on our ways. We are called to deny ourselves in the church. We are called to prefer one another in the church. We are called, even as we live out the gospel, to deny ourselves opportunities of enjoying the things of this world so that we may enjoy God. We are called to enjoy one another, to enjoy the things of God, to enjoy fellowship more than we enjoy the things of this world, to enjoy the wealth of Christian heritage, even by way of singing some of these songs and one hymn that we sang that is from of old, to enjoy something like that, and to enjoy uh, God, and then you will enjoy your salvation, and you will enjoy the saints in the church, and you will enjoy those blessings that come with having those people in your life, the believers in your life, and you will enjoy the benefits that come with having God's word guiding you in your life. You, the believer, should not be influenced or persuaded anyhow by people who rely on worldly reasoning to do church and to live your life. Rely on God. Rely on other believers. It is important. And as I said, God is not going to try and persuade people to do otherwise. There are people who will still see worldly things as more beneficial to them than God's things. And in that way, unfortunately, keep on deceiving themselves. There are people who will rely on their reasoning and will try to defend themselves. We are told by Paul there that we should not even rely on our reasoning because God knows that our reasoning is futile. We should rely on his reasoning. Our reasoning is futile. And I believe that the force of this text that we're looking at is, is that if a person is convinced that he or she is wise in their own eyes, God is the only person who can say whether you are wise or not. Nobody, not even pastors, can say whether what you are doing is pleasing in the sight of God or not. No one can say whether your motives are pleasing in God's sight or not. That is God's prerogative. As we saw in the last day, he will be the one to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We cannot. God knows our motives more than we even know our motives. And we can't even know the motives of others. It is God's prerogative. One author commenting on these verses that we're looking at says, God's inquisition of you will either uphold or overturn your own self-assessment because he sees what you don't see. He sees beyond your deeds. He sees beyond your thoughts. He even sees beyond your conscience. He even sees beyond your deepest intentions and aims. God's gaze goes where your conscience can even go sometimes. God's gaze goes to your unconscious motives and desires that truly drive you. Have you heard something like unconscious bias? 
when people become biased and then they'll say it was not conscious. Well, in God's side, it doesn't matter. You've done it, you're guilty. Whether you intend it or not. Whether you know or not. Whether your motives were not to do it or not. God knows your desires. You may say, well, I'm trying so much to fight the sinful desire. The fact of the matter is, you are the one who is sinfully desiring what is sinful. It's not God. There's no defense. You cannot fight against God. And then he continues to say, we are not justified. We do not declare ourselves right by our good opinions of ourselves. And we are not even condemned by our bad opinion of ourselves because that is also a reality. We may condemn ourselves when in fact we are pleasing in the sight of God and others may even condemn you when you do something right if it's pleasing in God's sight and that's all that should matter, what God says. And then he concludes by saying, we simply do not have that authority to either approve or condemn ourselves. We do not even have that right. It is reserved for God alone and for his final coming day of judgment. We fail, brothers and sisters, to realize how deceptive our hearts are. We fail at realizing how deceptive our emotion, emotions are. We fail at re realizing how deceptive our opinions can be. Because if we realized, if we knew how deceptive our hearts, emotions, opinions, consciences can be, then we would never be self-deceived. It is that elusive. This is why God calls you to trust in his wisdom that you may be godly wise. And if you trust in his wisdom, then verse 19, if you look at verse 19, says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, but the wisdom of God, on the other hand, is wisdom before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. Trust in God and trust in His reasoning and in His ways for you to be wise. And here Paul is arguing, quoting from Job chapter 5, verse 13. And Psalm 94, verse 11, those two are important for you to, to look at. But in those two passages that Paul relies on, God says this against the people who are able to reason well and even able to say that they are wise. He says that your ways are crafty. That is how you are able to convince yourself and even able to convince others that what you're doing is wise. God calls that craftiness. It's cunning. But then the analogy that is given there is of a metaphor of trying to catch prey and say that God is, has set up a snare and you also have set up a snare. And both of you are trying to see whether you will be able to catch your self-deception. Let us say your self-deception is what you want to catch. You set up a trap. You say, I will examine myself. I will, I will see my motives, my thoughts, my feelings. I will see. And then the picture that we're given there is that God will know before you even know. Before you even start, he already has caught you in your craftiness. Even if others are convinced or even if you are convinced. God has, God has gone far ahead of you already. And there are people who are able to convince others, but God knows their reasonings too well. God cannot and will not be outsmarted by anyone. He knows what is true. He knows what is godly wisdom. He knows what is not godly wisdom. And he knows in order for him to say to you when that day of judgment comes, whether you are pleasing in his sight or not. 
He's not going to rely on anybody or anything. He will rely on his ways. One commentator says, regarding verse 19 and verse 20, that the ultimate irony of these two verses is that people are cunningly avoiding the God with whom they have to do. But God has used the very cunning to ensnare them. In other words, people think that they are wiser than God. People don't want to examine themselves. People don't want to accept that they may be unwise in God's sight. People don't even want to accept that there may even be a possibility that they're not pleasing in God's sight. And the irony of this and what I called earlier on, something that is wholly frightening is that God will allow you to say that and by that he will trap you and you will be judged by that. He will say, okay, you say you're wise. Yes, you are wise. It's like a child standing over the cliff wanting to jump over. And then they ask you, should I jump? And then you told them, if you jump, you're going to get hurt. And then they say, should I jump? And then you'll say, okay, jump. That's what God will do with cunning people. As commentators say that they think themselves to be wise, they are in fact fools. And the second text, he says, emphasizes their ultimate futility. God knows their reasonings, that they are futile. The obvious point for Paul, therefore, is that the Corinthians are themselves fools if they do not take seriously this divine view of things. The divine view of things, firstly, is pause and examine yourself and ask the Lord to search you to find in you whether there may be any grievous way in you. And if there may be, ask God to help you. Because here he's talking about things that you may not know or see. But then people go on trying to find reasons and ways that they may not be found to be displeasing in God's sight. And then Paul is saying, but don't you know that God knows your reasoning already? Why are you trying to reason as if God does not know your reasoning? Rather, agree with God and look to his word to do things his way. And so what do you have to do then so that you may not find yourself deceived and displeasing in God's sight? And I will close with a few points of application uh, that I pray that will help you to be pleasing in God's sight so that you may not be self-deceived. Firstly, it is to humbly accept. Humbly accept that God, especially in the building of the church, because this comes after Paul told us how to be involved in the building of the church, accept that God will build his church not according to our ways, but according to his ways. Accept, secondly, that his ways are only found in the sufficient Bible and do things God's ways as they are found in the Bible, especially in the church. And then in prayer, then, and in communion with the saints, ask God to help you if, to see if there may be any way in you that is not pleasing in his sight. And then in prayer and in communion with the saints, in fellowship with your brothers and sisters, those who are people of the truth, who know the truth, ask your brothers and sisters in the church to tell you the truth, to tell you whether you are walking in ways that are pleasing in God's sight or not. Because you may not know. Ask them to honestly assess you. And... Um, I think a long time ago I gave this challenge because I think our friends visited uh, Kitu and I and they did this. Um, so they asked um, the, uh, I think it was the husband, I think, of one of our friends said, let's ask our wives to tell us the truth about us, how they actually feel 
and what they see. And uh, how I felt that day, I said, I don't, I'll never do this again. <laughs> <laughs> and we were sitting there saying, hey, we, we are doomed. We'll never know what to do. <laughs> because it felt as if there's nothing right that we ever do. Uh, they were truthful. Um, it's painful. But you have to have that with people that you are around. And especially God, and, and, and God will do that. He'll do heart surgery while you're still alive. And sometimes it will be painful. But it is to help you, so he saves you to save you and to love you. And that was about four years ago, around 2020, when Kitu and I did that. And we are still happily married, and we married for 10 years. Fortunately, that didn't drive her away, drew us closer. Um, even though I didn't admit to certain things in my heart, I knew that she was right. <laughs> And don't be ashamed of the gospel and what the gospel requires of you and to tell people. The world may see it as weakness and may see you as a fool to walk according to the gospel, but it is the power of God that saves. You will be saved and you are saved. And don't strive and aim for greatness according to the world's standards, but strive to be found faithful in God's sight. Even if Christians may say this is great and this person is great, don't ever strive to be regarded as great by other Christians. Just be faithful. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully and he will reward you in due time. And also don't be anxious about the future because some of the sinful things and sinful ways that we adopt that are not pleasing in God's sight come as a result of being anxious regarding the future and thinking, God's ways are not helping, and especially in our country, and we'll hear more about this, Lord willing, this evening for communion from Isaiah chapter 40. We should, be, we should feel secure in God, and that God knows what he's doing. He's involved in our world. He's involved in our country. He knows. We should trust him and trust his ways. And we should know that he will take care of us, no matter what will happen. Take God and the things of God seriously. And also know that all of true wisdom is found from God alone. Society's heroes cannot guide us. And so we should trust in God. And what you have to care about as a believer is to truly love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your body, and with all your soul. And God will give you sincere motives. Don't try to have or manufacture sincere motives. God will give you sincere motives if you love him. He'll give you wisdom to understand how to do things. Because in, our, in doing ministry and in having fellowship with one another, we don't always know what to do. And sometimes the offenses that we cause to one another come in the process of trying to do what is, what is right and trying to serve one another. But... God will guide us and he will help us there. And then we have to just do things by his word so that we may not deprive ourselves of the blessings that come from him, especially the blessing of enjoying our salvation, the blessing of enjoying God telling us the truth about who we are and what we have to do and seeing God bless us when he approves of the way we do things. And knowing and resting in the fact that God will reward you on that day of judgment when he will say to you, well done, a good and faithful servant. And we will see more of what Paul has to say to us uh, then so that we may not be self-deceived. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our God. And God... You are wiser than us, and Lord, we know that sometimes when we hear of difficult things, Lord, it is, it is hard to accept things that come from you. It is difficult to make sacrifices for you and to serve you, Lord, wholeheartedly. But Lord, we thank you that you are a God who cares about us, and when you tell us these things, Lord, you do so in love, and it is not because you do not love us. It is because you love us as your children. You love those whom you discipline. 
and we thank you for your discipline. But we also thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word to guide us, Lord. You've given us one another, Lord, to help us to serve one another. And we thank you, Lord, for those times when some of us have had, Lord, to, to sit with our brothers and sisters telling us, Lord, how we have offended them or, or how we have not served well, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for people who are willing to be truthful with us, even though it is hard. We thank you, Lord, that that helps us to, to serve you better and to serve you well. So help us, Lord, to not rely on our flesh. Help us, Lord, to even be gentle and kind with our unbelieving friends and family who may want to guide us, especially where you have already spoken, to gently tell them that, Lord, you have spoken. And to take your, your guidance, Lord, that even comes from your people, to trust your people, that you have given them the Holy Spirit to be able to counsel us. We are able to counsel one another. Help us, Lord, to, to take all these truths and many other truths, Lord, of your word about how we have to build your church. Because, Lord, if we do things this way, they will contribute, Lord, directly to your church being strengthened, your church growing, people maturing in the church, discipleship happening. Lord, us praying for one another, knowing what to pray for. So we pray, Lord, that you will help us then to, to do these things and not quarrel or argue with you, Lord, when you teach us. Help us, Lord, to trust in you and not be anxious about anything. In Jesus' name, amen.